Well, welcome back to episode 37 of the Real Estate Syndicator Live. And if you're uh, interested in structuring your fund, then you've come to the right place. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, get a little bit more into the details, a bit more in the weeds of how to structure your real estate fund. Uh, I'm going to break it down into two sections. And uh, for those of you watching the replay, I'll put timestamps to all of these so you can follow them. But the first one I'm going to talk about is the top five challenges that we see when uh, structuring a fund. These are kind of the common common themes we see and uh, things that you don't typically think about when you're doing a project-specific deal, but come up in a fund. And then we're going to talk about specific sort of GPLP structures that uh, sort of uh, our, our clients, some of our top clients are using, give you guys some ideas of how these are being structured. So uh, we'll do that. And of course, we'll we'll open it up to Q&A after that. Um, I'll ramble for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. If you've got a question, put it in the chat and uh, let's get going. Top five challenges. Uh, or issues, or what do you want to call it? Um, the f- the first interesting thing that pops up with funds is 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 the exemption, right? So typically, when we do a project specific, we're typically doing a five hundred six B or five hundred six C. But when we're doing a fund, uh, we have a lot more options. Um, Reg A, for example, comes to mind. That starts popping into the equation because a Reg A doesn't really work if you're doing a project specific because you don't have you know nine months to get it through the process. But when you're doing a fund, that's something you should consider. So with a Reg A plus, obviously you get the benefit. It's almost like a B and a C together, where you get the benefit of actually um, advertising your deal and also taking non-accredited investors. So that's something you should definitely consider if you're doing a fund. And maybe even regulated crowdfunding is an option, although. The limits there are pretty low. So uh, you're probably, if you're going to put the time and effort and money to to do a fund, you're probably going to be raising a little bit more than a million or a million and a half dollars, which is the regulated CF uh, uh, limitation. But just think of that. So just open your horizon a bit more on, on the exemptions. You've got a few more options when you're doing a fund because there's no real time pressure as you do with a um, project specific. Uh, the first major sort of from a structural standpoint that we we look at is the length of the fund. Right? Is it going to be a, a finite length like your typical um, uh, project specific? Is it going to be a five-year fund, a ten-year fund, a three-year fund, or, or what have you? Or is it going to be one of these evergreens? Uh, and by evergreen, it simply means it's sort of this open-ended fund that doesn't really have an end date. You just constantly have it open. And a lot of people were asking about evergreens, uh, but that's kind of the first major decision you got to figure out. Um, the evergreen comes with a lot of hair. Um, the two main things that you that kind of pop up on the if you're trying to think about a, of a evergreen is this idea that because it's an ongoing it's an ongoing raise, facts are constantly changing. So you're continually um, adding you know assets to the portfolio. You know your financials are changing. There's a lot of updates that we need to do on the PPM and the offering documents. Because if you can imagine when you just start your fund. You've got nothing in there, right? And so, you know, you're just raising 50 million or 25 million or 10 million to go buy, and you describe whatever you're buying. But, you know, a year later or two years later, well, a lot of that isn't really pro forma. Now we actually have actual data. We have two years of financials or a year's worth of financials. Um, and some properties may be doing great, some properties maybe not, not be doing so great. So you're going to have to constantly update your, you know, your offering docs to keep updated with that fund if it's forever. And so, uh, we typically, you know, at least once a year, we want to take a look at the offering docs and do an update on those. So we make sure that all of our material facts are being disclosed. Uh, but honestly, I would say, you know, once a quarter, at a very minimum, you're probably giving them, you know, financials, right? I mean, that's going to be a material fact uh, from your syndicate, from your fund is, you know, what do you have in your fund? What assets do you have and how are they performing? So you should have a breakdown of each of your properties and how they're doing. And so that's probably going to be an addendum to the business plan or however you want to do it. But at least once a year, if not uh, more regularly, if there's more material changes, uh, we're going to be updated our, our docs. So that's something you want to consider when you're doing an evergreen fund. Um, and then the other issue that pops with evergreen is pricing. You know, somebody that comes in right at the beginning of the fund, are they going to pay the same price as somebody that comes in a year from now or two years from now? Right? Uh, it creates a lot of kind of a lot of issues. So unless you're doing sort of a flat return, like I'm giving every, giving everybody a twelve percent return and it's flat and it doesn't really matter whether you came in on day one or in day two hundred, uh, if 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 you're not giving people flat, then it's you know you, as you can imagine, it's not super fair for somebody coming in at the end to be paying the same amount of money that from the first person you know that came into the fund that's you know, arguably putting in a lot more risk because it's an unknown commodity. So typically what happens is you have some kind of a pricing structure where it increases typically based on on NAV, on, on net asset value, but you need some kind of formula 
ahead of time. You need to structure that formula and disclose that to the investors so that you know that, hey, you know, today the price is $1,000 a share, but once we start getting assets or whatever, this is how we're going to calculate uh, increasing things. So uh, that's probably the, the big the big sort of first, first obstacle is figuring out what is the length of your fund? Are you going to do a finite fund or are you going to do an evergreen fund? Um, the other issue that comes up and challenge is, you know, how are you going to uh, raise the money? Right? Are you going to raise? And I'm not talking about sort of the initial capital, but in general, are you going to raise all the money right away in the first couple of months? You're just going to say, "Hey, look, I'm going to go raise ten million dollars. I'm going to raise as much money as I can uh, in this three months. And if I get to ten million, great. And if I don't, I'm going to shut it down." Or are you going to just sort of continually raise, even though it's not an evergreen? It might you may you know shut it down in a year or less. Uh, you you sometimes raise enough money to go buy the first property, right? And once you buy the first property, then you continue to raise, so on and so forth. Um, and you know, one of the issues that pop, there's two issues that pop up in that scenario. One is same issue that we just came up with, which is the pricing mechanism. Again, somebody that comes in on day one probably shouldn't be paying the same price uh, for the shares as somebody that comes in six months or a year later when properties are already in and the fund's doing okay. The other issue that really pops up when you have these sort of delayed um, uh, delayed funding is the audited financials. Most folks forget that when you're doing a 506B or 506C or any reg, you know, any reg D offering, one of the prerequisites is actually that you provide audited financials to your non-accredited investors. So that, I guess this theoretically only applies if you're doing a 506B with non-accredited, but you're obligated in general, this is not just for funds, but in any 506B deal, you're obligated to give them audited financials. Now, the reality is when you're doing a project specific deal, there are no financials, right? It's a brand new entity. We create brand new companies. And so there are no financials, let alone audited financials, which is why it's not an issue. That's why you never really hear about it or nobody's ever asked you to say, hey, let's put together a, uh, audited financial statements. But if you're delaying collecting the money in the funds, or if it's an evergreen fund, well, now that's different. You know, a year from now, you are going to have financials. You're going to have you know a year's worth of financials or six months from now, you're going to have financials. So just be aware of that. And so if you're still raising money six months or a year, or certainly more than that, uh, from the time you started the fund and actually had all the docs done, you're probably going to have a, at some point, and talk to your legal counsel when that magic time arrives, but at some point, two quarters, three quarters down the line, you're going to be obligated to hand your investors audited financials if they're not accredited. And as I mentioned earlier, even if they are, are accredited and they're all accredited, I would definitely be sending them financials in general. I mean, Look, I'm an investor. If I'm investing in a deal, I'm going to want to, and this company's been around, this fund's been around for a couple of years, I'm going to want to have access to the financials, even though they're not audited. So I can see you know, how much money's in the bank, what prop is due on, what's the cash flow looking. So I'm, I'm making, a, at that point, I'm almost making, an, um, making a, an investment in the particular company. So that's another issue that you're going to think of in terms of the structure is you know, ideally the easiest one would just be like, look, we're going to raise all the money within the first quarter, right? So if, if we're launching our fund today, bring it all the money in the first three months. And if at the end of three months, we still haven't reached, we're just going to shut it down. That's as much as we raised because um, that just makes it simple for a variety of reasons. One, I don't have to worry about different valuations because everybody's in the first three months. So everybody's kind of starting equally. And then I don't have to worry about audited financials because in that first quarter, there are no audited financials. So that's something to consider. I would, if possible, I would just try and raise all the money you know, straight from the beginning. Um, the other issue that comes up, which is probably the main one, I would say, when when we're doing funds and, and structuring it, is how, how are you going to accept the initial capital contributions? One of the biggest fears that investors have or fund managers have is, look, they, they raise $5 million, $10 million into their fund to go buy whatever asset class they're going to go buy. And for whatever reason, they just can't find a property, you know? And so, you know, you're just sitting there with the capital in your bank account and, you know, are you supposed to be giving them some kind of a return? Is there a pref that's accumulating? Or maybe you're giving them some interest rate or maybe not. Maybe they're just earning zero and the investors aren't happy that their money is with you sitting in a bank account for six months while nothing's happening. So uh, one of the things that we generally recommend, uh, Bethany and I typically recommend is that you take not a soft commitment because a lot of people say, well, I'm going to take soft commitments because I don't want the money. I don't need the money until I find a deal. Problem with soft commitments, obviously, is that you know things happen, right? People commit to, to, to giving you 100 grand and then three months later when it's time to collect, they come up with whatever excuse. You know, Some are legitimate. You know, They had a family emergency. They've got you know, medical bills or what have you. But more, more than likely, there's just going to be another investment that came along and they just got tired of waiting, <laughs> waiting for you to call them to say you had a deal. So they put the money somewhere else. An easy fix, we believe, is to just sort of take an initial deposit 
Um, most of the time, it's about a 10% deposit, but we have had clients do a 20%. It's whatever you feel is, is, is sufficient to kind of hook them in there, where even if they found another investment, if they put down a 10% deposit and they lose that deposit, if they don't end up doing the second cash call or when you actually need the money, then, uh, then that 10% usually usually handles it. And so the mechanism for that is simply we prepare all the documents just like any other syndication. You've got the PPM, the operating agreement, all that great stuff. But you know they subscribe for $100,000, but instead of wiring you $100,000, they're going to wire you $10,000 and they're going to wait for you to tell them when you need the other 90. But when you need that other 90, within whatever days we put in there, three days, four days, five days a week, whatever we say, if you don't give us the remaining 90 grand, then you're going to forfeit that 10% and you're not going to be in the deal. And that generally eliminates the issue of somebody finding another deal because it's already got sort of a 10% penalty baked in, which is not something that most people want to do. So that's another structural thing that 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 we spend a lot of time on the front end discussing with our clients of, of how we're going to handle that. Um, and then the other, probably the, the number five, which is, um, I know it's, I put it in last, but it's probably one of the more, more important ones along with the initial capital is the exit. Uh, what is the exit for your fund? And and when I say exit, I'm thinking of two different things. One is the exit for the investors, and one I'm thinking of the exit of the property. So let's take let's take them one at a time. Exit of the investors is like again, if you've got a 10 year fund or 15 year fund or an evergreen fund, are investors sort of locked in for the entire 10 years, 15 years, or are there withdrawal windows where investors can actually you know give you notice and say, look, I've been in this fund for five years or two years or 10 years. I want out, right? And so that's probably one of the the most time consuming or or not difficult, but time consuming thing to structure on one of these funds because we got to figure out number one, number one, are we going to allow them to to get out? Some people don't. People say, look, I'm doing a five year fund, and you're coming in today, and you're not going to be able to get out until I liquidate everything in five years. That's probably the easiest. That's great. But if it's more of like a 10-year fund, you're going to get some pushback. Some people aren't going to want to have their money locked in with you for 10 years. And so typically we have withdrawal windows. I would recommend having one window per year. I don't think you should have somebody coming in and out of your fund at will because that's going to be a nightmare from a bookkeeping standpoint. Your bookkeeper is going to probably hate you. So I would just say, look, uh, you know, if you want to be out by the end of the year, there's a window. I don't know, I'm making this up, but you know, between August 1st and September 15th or whatever, where you've got to give me notice that you want to withdraw. And then we're going to have X amount of days to to actually get you that money back because you know you may not have the money, so you may have to go raise additional capital. You may have to liquidate some of your some of your funds. Um, so you've just got to negotiate or not negotiate. You got to you've got to work with your attorney to figure out what the right window looks like. Um, at a minimum, I would lock them in for some minimum amount of time. So even if it's a ten year fund, you know you could have them say, hey, look, you've got to be in at least for two years or at least for three years, and then after that, there's going to be a window that's going to open. And then you can get out, you know, at that point. And then every year thereafter, there's going to be this window. Uh, I would caution you not to have huge timelines in between those windows because think of it as if you can only get out every five years, for example, say, well, you're in for the first five years, you can then get out, but then you're stuck. If you don't get out, you're going to be stuck for another five years. What's going to happen is everybody's going to want to get out in five years because they don't want to wait for the other five. So that's something you need to consider. Uh, One of the things we like to do. Uh, if there's a concern that there might be too many people that want to withdraw at the same time, which obviously for your fund would be sort of catastrophic, is we often cap the amount of withdrawals to some percentage of the fund. So let's just make it up here, let's say 20 or 25%. So that if there's, you know, every withdrawal period, if there's more than that 20 or 25%, you're going to limit everybody's withdrawal pro rata to that amount. So if you've got a $10 million fund and we're limiting it to 20% withdrawals and only you know, two million of that ten million dollar fund can come out at any given withdrawal window, and if there's more than two million that people want, then everybody's going to have to take a little bit less pro rata, so that we can stay within that two that two uh, year window. Because again, if if seventy five percent of your people want out, then you're going to start having to liquidate your properties, and it may not be the best time to liquidate them. So that's something that we'd spend a lot of time on. In fact, one of the things we tend to do for our clients is just to make sure that if if we um, if there is a withdrawal provision, we 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 have it there for a long time. I mean, you've got to give notice, you know, six, not six months, but probably three or four months before the end of the year. And then you've got another three or four months, you know, after they give you notice to to actually, you know, get you the cash. So it, it ends up being a good six or seven month window that you have. But um that's the number one question investors are gonna say is like, hey, how do I get my money out? If this is a 10 year or an evergreen, how do I get my money out? So anyway, so those are kind of the five 
challenges. It's the exemption, you know, the length of the fund. Uh, number three will be how do you raise the capital if it's all going to be up front or as you go along? Number four, how do you take that initial capital? Do you take it all up front or do you, you know, take some semi-soft commitments? And then what does the exit look like? Those are probably the five, uh, the five um, sort of the biggest challenges that we see. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about was just sort of GPLP structures, uh, because this is a, something, a question that we get a lot, not only just in funds, but in our, in our syndication structures as a whole. Um, the, the first thing I would say is that typically in a fund, and I think this comes from the, the hedge fund world, you hear this two and 20, right? 2% uh, uh, assets, asset, an asset management fee, which is 2% of whatever your assets under management are, and then 20% of the profit. That's kind of an 80-20 split. So that's kind of your typical, I think that's your typical fund structure. But um, the first thing I want to point out on the fund structure is, you know, let's talk about some of the different structures that people use uh, just in terms of the investors, right? Uh, one of the things that we see a lot are, or the, maybe the first decision you've got to make, but we certainly see a lot of this these days is, are you going to have any preferred equity in your fund? Or in any syndication, to be that matter. And by, when I say preferred equity, it's it's almost a defined term. For me, a preferred equity is usually a larger institutional player, and they're getting, you know, typically a fixed return, right? They're getting twelve percent or ten percent, but more importantly, they're preferred in the sense that they're going to be first money's in and first money's out. So they have a lot less risk involved than your sort of your common equity, because if there's a sale or if things aren't going well they get their money out first as the preferred equity versus sort of the common common shares and the common equity. So that's something that you, that's kind of the first decision you got to make. Um, and then the other decision you've got to make is, do you want to incentivize people in your fund to, you know, contribute more than the minimum? So a lot of the funds we work with have sort of a minimum, you know, let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar minimum investment. Great. But we want to give people sort of a, an incentive to put in 250 if they can. Or 500, or a million. Uh, generally speaking, what we found out is is that if 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 the minimum is 50 grand or 100 grand, that's what an investor is going to put in, especially a first time investor in your fund. Even though they may have the ability to uh, add, you know, put some more money into it, They're, it's just human nature. They're going to put the minimum. So giving them that little carrot to to give them a little bit better terms if they give you more money, or maybe some perks. Uh, by giving you more money, that's that's a structure that I think works very well, and, and those are sort of at the same level. It's not like a preferred equity where somebody's got sort of a first in, first out, but they are different classes of units or classes of shares in a particular uh, syndication, and um, they just have better terms. Like if if the regular terms might be you know an eight percent pref and uh, you know seventy thirty. Uh, but if you put in 250, then you're going to get a 10% pref and you're going to get a 75, 25. So your IRR will be a little bit higher than everybody else. And uh, if you put in 500 grand, then you're going to get you know 12% pref or you know, whatever you want to do, but you're constantly giving them a little bit more of a carrot. Uh, or you can offer them other incentives. Um, when we were doing a ton of deals uh, down a sort of resort properties, one of the things our clients were doing was, you know, if you invest a certain amount, you would get a free stay at the the resort property that we're investing in. So you guys that are doing hotels or resorts or Airbnbs or whatever, you can say, look, minimum investment is 50K, but if you put in 100 or 150, then you get a one week stay or one night stay or whatever you want to give them. Um, and then, you know, other people, I remember, you know, our, our good friend, Brandon Turner over in the Hawaii, he likes to do this cabana club thing where he basically, if you put in a lot of money into his deals, he's going to fly, not going to fly you up, but he's going to host a party in Hawaii and sort of do a little get together for, for some sort of, for those high, uh, high investors. So whatever it is, just some sort of a structural incentive for them to put minimum. Cause there are a lot of people that can put more, more money in, uh, but you've got to give them a reason to do that. Uh, so that's the second thing I would talk about. Um, and then waterfalls. Uh, most clients use at least, well, one waterfall. Waterfall is just sort of, you know, how is the, when there's money to be distributed, how does that get distributed? Does it just get split 80-20? Like I just mentioned, is it just, hey, if there's $100 to distribute, is it just 80-20? Or are there waterfalls, meaning first level of a waterfall is typically a, prefer, a preferred return. So maybe there's an 8% pref or a 7% pref in the deal where all of that money that's available is going to go to the investors until they hit that 7% or 8% or whatever that preferred return is. Not a guarantee because if there's not enough money to distribute, they might end up getting 3 or 4 or 5%, but they get all the money first, 100% goes to the investors until they hit that return. Then there's a split, right? And that split can be kind of 
divided into tranches. And again, I wouldn't go crazy on this, but it's not uncommon to see, you know, maybe it's an 80 20 split until a certain level is reached, maybe a 15% return or an 18% return. And then once the, the syndicator hits that return, then it's going to be a 50 50 split. So it's kind of an 8% pref, meaning 100% goes to the investors. Then the investors get 80% until some some watermark gets reached. And then after that, they're going to get 50%. So uh, it, it's sort of an incentive for the syndicator to get paid more as they you know, are more successful and can do more and more on their deal. So waterfalls are, are, are a big part of the structuring. Um, a lot of clients do flat returns. Uh, and this is a, an easy, I, this is a recommendation I would do if you're going to do like an evergreen fund or just something that's be take a while for you to raise, or you're going to have people coming in and out at different times, just give them a flat fee. You know, I'm, I'm paying you 10% flat. You get all, you get, it's almost like a 10% prep or a 12% prep, but that's it. Anything above that is going to go to the sponsor. Um, and that again, makes the accounting easy. And it doesn't really matter if somebody comes in on day one or day 700. Uh, you don't have to worry about coming up with net asset values or revaluing the, the value of the shares. They're just going to get, you know, 12% or 10% or whatever. Um, that's that's a structure that we see quite a bit. Um, and then I'll, the last structure I'll point out just to kind of give you some ideas and feel free to steal any of these. But the, one of my favorite structures that we came up with for a client was um, sort of a really high, not guarantee, obviously, but uh, sort of a, a fixed return is what I call it. So let's just pick a fixed return. We started doing these, uh, I think at eight, what is it? No, it was 16%. So you tell your investors, look, I'm going to pay you a 16% return, but here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to pay you an 8% return up front or sort of as a pref, as ongoing. And then I'm going to pay you the, the back end, the other 8% once we refinance or sell or whatever, you know, whatever, really at any time that you want to. So however you're going to get funds, usually you don't get the funds until there's some liquidity event, which is like a rehab, uh, a refinance. But when you refinance, you know, I'll give you the other eight percent. Um, and the nice thing about that structure is that investors just know they know going in that they're going to get sixteen percent. They don't have to guess. Uh, and of course, if you hit it out of the ballpark and you end up making, you know, two x or three x uh, equity, then that anything above that sixteen percent uh, is going to be for you. And and you know, it can be sixteen percent, be twelve percent. It can be a six and six, a seven and seven, an eight and eight, and a, a six and eight. I mean, you can do whatever combination you want. But the idea is you're giving your investors. Ahead of time, you're telling them what the returns are going to be, but you're only paying a portion of it from the cash flow, and then the rest of it's going to be, you know, on the back end when there's some liquidity event. So anyway, that seemed like a lot of uh, babbling on my end, uh, which is a little bit longer than I thought. But as I was getting into it, I was just kind of thinking of more and more things. So um, luckily today, I've got my co-host Bethany in the house. Who actually, Bethany, did did I miss anything? Because you you're kind of the fun <laughs> queen anyway. You probably you know you. You know, just as much as not more than I do on the fund. So, is there any, anything that I kind of skipped on that one? I wouldn't say you missed anything. There's always nuances, right? I mean, the clients are going to tell us what, you know, you're going to tell your attorney what your goal is, right? And then it would be the attorney's job really to help you figure out how to structure it based on what your goal is. Um, so, no, I mean, the high level stuff that we see all the time, I see a lot of questions in here, which I think you covered a lot of, of the answers already. Um, but the, the main thing, same thing with a fund as a single asset syndication in that your focus is going to be on what do your investors want? What does your group of investors want? And then we're going to back into a structure that gets you there because that's how you're going to have to raise it. And and the thing that we always tell people, and, and you get excited until you hear the, the caveat, right? The thing we always tell people is you can do anything you want almost as long as we disclose it and as long as you can sell it. I love right? that. So. Any anything in between there, you know, um, it, almost anything goes. I I say almost because someone will come up with like, what about this? And it's going to be like, you know. <laughs> no, uh, I'm glad, you know, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I probably should have started with that because, you know, I obviously threw a bunch of different and, and I'm sure I know I went like a mile a minute. So to so watch the replay. Uh, but um, uh, but that's true. You can literally be as creative as you want to be. The name of the game is disclose, disclose, disclose. The reason I would stay away from like when I say, you know, don't get too crazy on waterfalls or just making it too complicated. Number one, investors, you know, a confused investor is not a good investor for you. So you want to keep it relatively simple, but also on the disclosure side, it's just the more complicated it is, the easier it is to sort of miss, you know, or, or for it to be argued that, you know, just wasn't super clear for the investor what, what this looked like. So keep it simple, but yeah, you can structure these things however you want, as long as we, as we disclose it. Uh, Bethany, do you mind going? I saw one question I want to answer, which is, you know, when you shut it down, meaning the fund, when you shut the fund down, is there a special procedure to return the funds to your investors. 
the answer is yes. And that procedure is going to be in the operating agreement. So every deal is going to be different. I mean, we obviously have our sort of our standard, but uh, there's going to be a sort of a levels. Like obviously, the, the you know, w- w- when you sell and shut down the fund, the first person that's going to get paid is your lender, <laughs> right? Well, actually, even before that, even pays all your closing costs, right? Your brokers and your your real estate agents. I mean, there, there's so there's anyway, there's a pecking order of who gets paid uh, in terms of non LPs and non GPs. And then once you get, once you're done with those people, the next person or group of people that's going to get paid are the investors in not initial capital, but unreturned or unrecovered capital. So for example, if the investor is giving you $100,000 and you haven't returned any of their capital, then you're going to have to first give them their $100,000 before you even go down the next pecking order. Uh, However, if during the fund you've been paying down that capital account or that that unrecovered capital, then maybe you owe them less than 100 grand. But before you take a dime, you're going to return all of your investors' money back to make them whole, make them sort of get all their initial capital back either then or combined with what you've been giving them. And then you start doing the waterfall and the distributions, you know, whether there's a PREF or whether it's 80-20 or whatever, the, the splits with the GPLP. But all of that, you know, if you were asking me if there was a dispute, if there was an issue, the first place I would point you to is the operating agreement because you want to make sure that you follow the terms because it, it should be in there uh, in terms of what the order is. And then if you're doing some of these um, more exotic structures, like the, the one I mentioned at the end where you're you're sort of, you know giving your investors sort of the second part of the return on a, on a refinance, that's typically done with what we call a call option. There's an option where you have, as a syndicator, have the option to buy out your investors at a determined predetermined price. And that predetermined price is the, the, the their entire return, so the second half of the return. So in that case, the call option would be all your money back plus the additional 8% annualized that we promised you if it was an eight and eight deal, or if it was a six and six, it would be your money back plus the 6% annualized. So obviously the more years that go by, then the more that's going to cost you. But uh, uh, but that's typically the, how these things get uh, get uh, wound down. And then of course we, you know, it probably makes, you know, once that is all done and you've shut down the bank accounts, um, we we haven't done an episode yet on insurance, but, you know, that's something else you may want to consider too, having some insurance. I think there's some insurance policies called their, their, their tail policies that kind of, you know, just in case something were to pop up. But uh, generally, at some point, you want to shut down that entity down and and just, um, you know, once all the money's been distributed, just uh, dissolve the the LLC. Paul, I think you've asked a couple of questions that we we get a lot. And I think that boils down to what kind of exemption you're under the first one, which is you see a lot of, I think what you mean is syndicators uh, making broad asks just out there kind of pimping for us or investors. And, and if you're in a 506C and you accept only accredited investors and you're going to verify them, you can shout it from the rooftops. You can put it on Facebook. You can do almost anything you want so long as that it's true and it's not misleading. Um, so there, there's really no issue there. But the other question that you said is one of the top three questions we get of all time, syndication or fund or otherwise, which is, is how do you pay people who aren't raising money for you? Um, and and somebody answered you correctly. <laughs> nice. Say. Who? Yeah. Let's so give a shout out. Give me a shout out. Yeah. Let's see. Where is it? Let's see. Uh, shout out. So, uh, so, so, Samir what? got it right. Yeah, there you go. Samir gets the prize. Um, which is that you you can't have transactions based compensation to a, someone who's raising capital unless they're a, a security a Finra broker dealer, um, licensed broker dealer or there are some other ways to, to do that, but typically speaking, you can't you can't pay someone transactions based compensation. So- yeah, yeah, and and going back to I wanted to just, just real touch on on the prior one. So on the exemptions, you know, most of the time we see you know, funds. You know, look, they're more expensive. They're more of a pain to set up. And so typically, when you're doing a fund, you're going to raise more. You're not going to do a million dollar fund or two million dollar funds. Funds usually are five, 10, 25, 50, hundred million dollars. And so because of the size of that, that raise, typically they include advertising. So most funds, not all, but most funds end up being sort of 506Cs or reg A's because people want to get the word out to as many people. Uh, and typically, you know, if, um, if it's a smaller amount, you're probably still doing a project specific because you're, 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 you're relying on your friends and family. So usually you grab, that's another thing I didn't mention. Usually you graduate to a fund uh, it's not something I would recommend a first time sending. If you're just starting out in the business or you've done one or two deals, a fund is hard because people are betting on you, the jockey, right? They, they don't know what you're buying. They, they 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 know sort of your parameters, but they can't look at your assumptions or challenge your assumptions. And so it's it's a lot harder to raise money, in my opinion, uh, under a fund, a blind fund than it is a project specific. And so typically you have to have either an audience 
Uh, so if you've got a podcast or you just have a big following that you can easily sort of you know reach, then that's that those are good candidates. And then of course people have just been doing it and have a just a great track record where people aren't even looking at your docs anyway. They, this is the seventh deal they've done with you. They know you, they trust you, they like you. And you tell them you have a deal, they'll probably give you a hundred grand with their eyes closed without even doing a deep dive. So that's why most of them do are are 506 Cs. Uh, and again, Reg A is, you know, you have the time. You don't, you have, there's no time pressure. So if you want to go through the process and, and wait nine months or whatever it's taken these days, it's probably more than that because it's nine months through the process, then um, then that's that's a good option there. Good. good. I, I love, by the way, I love seeing when when our our clients and people we know listen to us are answering the questions for us. That, that makes me it. so happy. <laughs> Yeah, guys, you just can't take, you know, you just can't, you can't pay people to raise. I mean, you, you've got to be a, a, like Bethany said, a, either a broker dealer, or you can be an investment advisor, but even the investment advisor has to hang their license under a broker dealer. Um, and then the only other way, which is really not raising the money, but the other way is if you're really good at that and you want to do this as a, as a living, they just, just set up your own fund of funds. We, we did an episode a couple episodes ago, with fund of funds. And just set up a fund and go raise 10, 15, 20 million dollars into a fund and then go out there and look for operators to to invest that money in. But uh don't don't pay transaction-based uh including GP units to to folks who don't have a say I don't have a broker dealer license. No nobody in, in, who's asking that question is a broker dealer. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, um it, Mike has an interesting question, Mauricio. Um, I don't know Mike who uh he says. Is there a minimum amount you need to invest uh, yourself as a sponsor? Oh, actually, that was a question that was already answered. Um, the one above that, Cody, uh, rather than paying a preferred return, what are your thoughts on a best efforts return? I've got my thoughts on that. Mauricio, what about you? On a best efforts return? Yeah, not a raise, but a best efforts return. Uh, it, it, I if it's what I think it is, which is like, uh, you know, we'll give you, is that what it is? I mean, it's, it's, I'll give you whatever, it, you know, it whatever. Sounds like we, it's a, don't worry, we'll get you, <laughs> which I don't think it's going to be able to, I think it'd be hard to sell. If we disclose yeah. that's what it is. And someone says, sure, I'll just wait and see what you have to say when it's time. I guess you could, you could legally yeah. do that, but I don't know how you sell that. Yeah. From a legal standpoint, again, you would just disclose it, right? So, hey, the manager retains the right, you know, the, the distributions will be made at the sole discretion of the manager. And if they want to return, you know, this one. Now, now what you want to be careful though is, is you know, if the investors own it, if it's an 80-20, let's say your carried interest is 20%, uh, it's going to be difficult to argue that that return is going to be different. So um, you might be able to decide best efforts of when you, which you always do, by the way, you always have that option. I mean, you can always keep as much much money in reserves. And, you know, you could have a bunch of money coming in and you say, look, I'm not going to distribute any money because I think we need to keep some in reserves or for whatever reason. But, um, I, I, you know, it's going to be really hard to, uh, so you, you could say distributions were made at the sole discretion of the manager, but then I, you, you wouldn't be able to, I don't know how you would describe it. You wouldn't be just like, Hey, I, I feel like giving you 60% this, this year and 30% next year and 90% next year. Uh, that's your, that's not something we would not only recommend, I'm not sure I would be involved in a deal like that. Right. I, and I, I took that to mean as a preferred return. I mean, a split's a split, right? You hold out whatever you're going to hold in reserves. And then but for a preferred return, if it's sort of a, we'll see, you know. Yeah. You can always, you can always offer, give them more. I remember a client many, many years ago wanted to give them more. And so, so maybe you just put a really low pref. Hey, I'm, the pref's going to be 3%. And look, if you end up giving them a 7% pref instead of a 3% pref, I, I don't, A, I don't think anybody's going to mind. And B, I don't think that would be an issue. No, I don't. Uh, oh, but I, the question before that, I, I'm glad you brought it up because I did see it at one of the pre-submitted questions, which was, I, I don't think we answered it, but the question was, and I think it was from Mike, was something a, around, you know, how much should a sponsor put in their own money? Mm -hmm. Like, is there a requirement? Like how much skin in the game should an investor have? And the answer to that is there's no legal requirement. A lot of people don't put any money into it. Um, I think if you ask a lot of investors, certainly seasoned investors, they want to they want to see skin in the game. So it's more of a market driven thing as opposed to a legal driven thing. But you know, I'll be honest. I mean, we you know, obviously we do hundreds of these, and so we we see what people are putting in, and it's not a crazy amount. I mean, most people that are raising a couple million bucks are putting you know fifty thousand dollars in. It's not like they're putting in two hundred or three hundred of half, you know, a third of the money or anything. So, uh, but it's not a requirement. It's it's just a um, it's just market driven. But again, I would disclose it though. I mean, if you're going to put in the documents that we're contributing, I would put in, hey, sponsors contributing 50 grand. Um, and then if you say that, then definitely don't put less. 
one of our one of our big clients that's doing a ton of deals, looking at doing a fund. Chad Sutton has a question for us. And Uh-oh. Chad, can you unmute and just ask your question? Wow, I've elevated to big client status. Thank you for that. that. <laughs> um, she, she's good at pumping up my ego. You hear that? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So we're we're definitely project based, as you all know, and, and looking to kind of get into the fun world. Um, one of our core, you know, one of our core missions is to make sure we're still including 506B or non-accredited investors because that's that's part of the core Quattro mission. You know, is making sure we can get those investors involved in deals they wouldn't otherwise have. So you mentioned you were talking a lot about audited financial statements, and you know, there's just extra disclosures and such you have to do. How? Uh, what? What other? Questions should about should I be asking about doing a fund, let's say a fifty million dollar five year fund that would be open to five hundred six B? I know I can't advertise, but is there any other fund specific pitfalls I'm running into in doing that? I, I you, we mentioned it briefly. I mean, I think getting all of your non accredited in early so that. And we're not even talking about pivoting, but even if you're just going to keep it a 506B, um, audited financials is just going to be, I think, I haven't yet to see a client that's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go spend 15, 20 grand on a finan- you know, audited financials, no mm-hmm. big deal. But if you get all of your non-accredited in, let's say in that first three three months or six months, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a judgment call depending on you know when you start acquiring stuff. But let's just say three to six months, if you can get all of your non-accredited and then after let's say three to six months, you start only accepting accredited investors, even though it's still a 506B deal, then you would alleviate the need to do audited financials because you're a new investor. It's for the it's at the time of sale, right? So you've already got your non-accredited. So that's one thing I would consider. Uh, but if you're going to do that, then I think I, I would actually look at the, the pivot, right? I would start my fund as a 506B, mm. call up all your non-accredited investors and say, hey, You've got three weeks. You know this is going to be open to you guys. So if you want to get in, don't wait. Get in as quickly as you can, and then three months from now, six months from now, you stop the five hundred six B. You pivot, and now you're moving forward. It's a five hundred six C. So you can only take you know a credit investment. And again, as I'm saying this, it really whether you pivot or not. That's I think that's a good strategy in terms of hey, I'm only accepting non-accredited in for the first three to six months. So. Don't get your butt in there. Get your money in there because I'm gonna. Mm-hmm. I'm even though I'm legally okay to accept non-accredited after that, I'm not going to because I don't want to spend the money yeah. doing not, uh, the audited financials. It, it makes a lot of sense. Go ahead, Bethany. Yeah, I would say um, two other things. One is Jeff pointed out no assets under management fees to non-accredited. We typically don't love the assets under management anyway. Asset management fees are typically going to be on your on your your receipts. But the other thing, Marisa, maybe talk for a second about. Um, non-accredited investors who come in early, but then maybe want to re-up, right? If you if I'm in and I want to double down, um, yeah, I mean that that's just an additional sale. So I mean, if you've got a non-accredited investor that you know that on day one says that great, here here's 50k, and then a year later they're like, hey, I got some more money, I want to I want to purchase. Think about it, they're purchasing an additional fifty thousand dollars of shares. That's a new sale of a security. So we've got to comply with the rules. So if at that point. If you're accepting non-accredited, then you're going to have to give that person audited financials, which probably doesn't make sense. Or if you pivoted and now you're doing a 506C, they wouldn't be able to come in. And what's going to be really interesting to take that a step further is if the SEC ends up updating the accredited investor definition, let's just say, and again, I don't want to get into that because we've talked about it in prior episodes, but let's just say hypothetically, uh, you know, the SEC increases the limit from a million dollars in net worth to three, then it's possible, especially if you have an evergreen fund, that whoever came in initially was accredited, great. But now, a year from now, when they want to put some additional capital in there, they may not qualify. They may not be an accredited investor anymore, which is crazy. Uh, they're going to be, you know, once they're in, they're in. There's not going to be a retro. I don't think so. I mean, I obviously haven't seen anything, but somebody keeps asking me about being grandfathered in. Obviously, if they're already in your fund and they've already signed the docs, you know, the, the point of sale already happened. But always be sensitive to that. And I think, again, Chad, to your point, it's just stuff you don't think about or have to worry about when you're doing a project specific. In a project specific, you you investors come in and you know you buy the asset, and then whenever the asset's done, you sell it. That's when everybody finishes. But you don't have this issue of continually raising or you know somebody wanting to double down, you know, a second time. All those issues only happen in funds, and this is why funds tend to be a lot more complicated because, again, with a project specific, 
I mean, Chad, you guys, you know, you, you guys sent us your business plan and great. It's, we, we, you know, it, we've been working on it for many, many years. So it's, it's great. But when we, when you do your first fund, you're gonna be like, well, crap, how do I write it? What do I do? How do I do this? How do I do that? There's gonna be a ton of questions. So that's why uh, I would definitely budget more time for a fund. Um, not so much an RN, to be honest with you, but in terms of getting that business plan and the structure finalized, that's going to take longer than you just sending us a business plan. We doing our deep dive and having revisions back to you in you know 24, 48 hours. Now it's going to be like, here are a thousand questions. And you're like, oh, well, crap, I don't know. Let me think about it. And then there's another call. And and then, and then you just have literally multiple calls until you, you, you figure out all these details. And then your business plan is complete. Then we can start drafting the docs. And then that'll be the usual you know, week to two weeks, depending on how quickly you need them. All right. Great conversation. I appreciate that. I'll, uh, Thanks, I'll re- relin- relinquish the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Irish Kevin. Uh, Kevin says Fundrise has a similar equity withdrawal timeline. Oh, sorry. Is there, is there a timeline? I'm, I may have been going out here. Uh, it does, does it come with a waiting period after initial request. Oh, yeah. So it does come with a waiting period after. Yeah, because when you do a withdrawal, I mean, there's a good, I mean, you should have cash as reserve. You should always keep, you know, maybe it's 5% of cash and reserves, but, but if, if all of a sudden you need to come up with a million dollars, I want to give you as much time as humanly possible, reasonably, you know, that the documents do. So I, we give you as much leeway as possible. Um, you know, certainly there's going to be an interest that's accumulating because obviously they're out of the deal and, and you haven't gotten their money back, but uh, yeah, there's going to be a, you, you don't want to be saying, Hey, if you give us a notice on August 1st, you'll have your money in 60 days. Cause you may you you may not you probably don't have it and you have to either liquidate or raise more capital. We have had some some clients bake into their documents. Yes, there is sort of a redemption option, but you can only get out at the time, uh, or we're only going to buy you out when there's sort of a natural capital transaction event. We were going to refi because the market makes sense to refi. We we're going to sell because the market makes sense to sell. So it puts everybody on notice. If you want to get out while we're doing these these uh, trans- capital transactions events, then you can, but we're not going to fire sale and we're not going to raise more money to get you out. And that works well with a, with a fund, right? Because the, yeah. obviously you're, you're, you're liquidating funds and you're not closing down the LLC like you would in a project. You're actually going to, it's going to stay open. And you may even, as one of my uh, challenges were that you may actually be reinvesting some of the money. And by the way, that, that reminds me, you've got to be super careful in describing what happens when that property sells on your fund? So there's three things that can happen. Number one, if your property, obviously you're going to pay the lender, it's the same thing, right? You're going to pay all your costs, but then there's going to be a hopefully a profit or some potentially distributable cash from the sale of that property. You want to make sure you are clear and it's defined in your document what happens to that money. Because your options are number one, you could return that money to your investors, right? That could be a capital you know, a return of capital because you've sold the property, there's a profit and we're going to split that 80, 20 or whatever the docs say. That's option one. Option two is like, no, we're just going to reinvest. This is a 15 year fund. So whatever profits we get from the sale of this property, we're going to reinvest and buy the next property. And we're going to keep doing that until the fund is over in 10, 15, 20 years. Or there might be a, a hybrid. There might be like, hey, we've got a bunch of money came in this quarter. And so we're going to return some of it to the investors, but then the others, we're going to we're going to continue keeping the fund so we can continue to acquire more properties. You can do it however you want. Just got to make sure you disclose it. And it's very clear on your, uh, you know, on your distribution your language, uh, you know, number one, what are you doing with it? And how are you categorizing? Is it a return of capital? Is it a return on investment? All that kind of stuff. A lot of good uh, questions. Yeah, I love this question. topic. <laughs> it's my favorite topic. Um, uh, Alan says, if the syndication has preferred investors and the project is not cash flowing as planned initially and the preferred rate cannot be met, in general, do, does a preferred rate accrue in arrears? Uh, yes. Generally speaking, it accrues in, in arrears. It doesn't have to. Again, that's just whatever you decide, however you want to structure it, however you want to disclose it in your documents, you can do it however you want. But but I don't want to say best practices, common practices is that if you promise, let's say an 8% preferred and in year one, you give all the money, all the distributable cash investors, but they only get a you know 4%. So you're short four. There's a couple ways that gets dealt with. The common way I believe is that it would just roll over to the next year. So the next year you owe me the 4% that you owe me from the prior year, plus my 8% preferred this, this, this year. And if you're short again, then the next year you owe me the eight from you know, from that and whatever, it just keeps going that that way. 
Uh, other people I have seen, it's not as common, but they just deal with it at the end. It's, it's like, hey, we owe you that 4%, but we're not going to pay it to you next year. We're going to pay it to you when we, on the back end, when we sell or refinance, you know, in our, in our waterfall, we're going to give all the money back to the investors first. Then we're going to give all the money to the investors to catch up on whatever we owe them on the pref. And then we're going to split it, whatever the splits are. But generally, generally speaking, I have seen a couple that do not accrue. Like, hey, SOL, if we don't eight percent pref, if we only got you four, it is what it is, right? Clean slate every year. Clean yeah. slate every year, and I, you know, that's not common. So I think you'll have a hard time. At least recently, you would have had a hard time raising capital because your com- competitors are are accruing and rolling it over. But look, as as um, as it gets tighter and tighter, and margins get tighter. You know, prefs will probably start going away. In fact, you know, our good buddy Ken McElroy, I mean, his prefs went away a long time ago. <laughs> he used to do, you know, seven percent prefs and you know whatever the the, the a third, two thirds splits, and then at some point, you know, he stopped doing those. So, uh, but again, it's all ne- not negotiable. It's all up to you. You can structure it however you want. Just make sure that it's in in your document spelled out really well. Paul has a, a number of questions. The one, the one that's the most recent one is: Can you assign? out parcels of a large retail unit into a fund and borrow against it as you improve it. I mean, that's, it's a very specific example, but I mean, I think the answer stands, which is, again, you can do almost anything as long as we disclose the structure of it. um, And as long as you can sell it to your investors, which means you've got to have a structure in place that you can, you can uh, sell to your investors, and then if it goes wrong, defend that that's really what you meant. <laughs> you know, you know, defend that it was clear. If I, I don't. Wrong. Yeah, I was going to suggest. Do, I, I should probably know this, but uh, I know Bethany, you do uh, sort of an office hours and funds. Is that open to anyone? Or is that open to it a specific is. person? No, it's open to anyone. So every, I was going to actually say it at the end, but every Wednesday at one thirty Pacific, Pacific, I do a thirty minute Zoom, um, a standing Zoom, just about funds. Um, and you can, if, if, if tonight your mind is reeling and in the middle of the night, you're like, Oh, I forgot to ask show up on Wednesday, every single week. Um, you can either come with your questions or you can come and just listen to other people's questions because maybe you don't know what you don't know. Um, and, and we get, you know, Rick, I see Rick over there nodding, Rick, Rick comes every week and sometimes he's just listening. Right. Yeah. And I put the email, if you, I think if you just email the office at team at yep. plglp.com to say, Hey, I'd like to hop on um, Bethany's whatever Wednesday yeah. office hours, then they'll give you the link to that. I think it's a zoom call, right? It's a zoom. Yeah. Yep. So every week um, we do that and uh, uh, you can bring your questions from tonight. Uh, yeah. And that, and that, and that we're, there's a lot less people on there. So you can start asking really specific questions about, right. you know, very, very specific. Uh, this is a good one. I said, Mike uh, says, is it true that no investor can own more than 20% of the syndication? What if I have an investor that wants to contribute 51% of the capital? Wow. So that's a good question because there's so many different things that pop into my mind, some legal, some not. Uh, number one, I would just caution you to have any investor that's putting in half of the money because it's not, I don't say it's common, but it has happened where you know you don't want a week before close so that if that person pulls out, right? If that person changes their mind or whatever, um, and you're a week from close, you're you're in, you've got a major problem as opposed to if somebody committed fifty grand or hundred grand. So you want to be super careful there. Uh, the issues that pop up if you own more than twenty percent, off the top of my head, I have two of them. Bethany, if you've got another one, let me know. The first one is uh, well, first of all, you're you're eligible. Not eligible, but you become part of the the you know the bad actor stuff. So the syndicators have to have to you know they have to pass bad actor. Uh, you can't be a bad actor in order to do a syndication, but it also applies to anybody that owns more than twenty percent. So if you have investors at twenty percent, you got to do a whole background check on them and make sure they're not a bad actor. If you don't ask me why, that's just the I don't know why they would care whether a passive investor is you know is a bad actor or not. Um, and then the other issue is just on underwriting. So the lenders typically want to. If you're owning 20% or more of the syndication, the lender's typically going to want to have you underwritten, which investors don't want to do. And that might be as low as 10%. So you want to check with the lender. Now, remember, it's 20% of, it might be just the voting rights, but it's 20% of the whole thing. And so if remember, the investor may only own, it might be an 80-20 split, right? So they may own 20%, but if they own 20% of 80%, then they only really own you know 60, whatever the math is, 60 something percent. So uh, it's probably a little bit more than that for those to get triggered for, for 20% of the entire deal. But those are the two that come to mind. Uh, I don't know if there's another one that I missed there, but that, but that's, I, but we were just talking about this in Atlanta today. I would just be cautious about accepting huge amounts of money. And if you are, I would probably have them put that in escrow early because you just don't want somebody pulling out at the last minute and then you're like, crap. 
Where, where do I find 20% in the next week? Yeah. And get the, and get your diligence done early too. Cause you don't want to have a report come back the day before closing either. Right. And you really, that is important. You really do need to do that. Um, Paula, don't do that. Do not create a business card that advertises you as a capital raiser. Oh gosh. No, no. I don't know if that was, if you were serious or not, but I definitely <laughs> would not do that unless you're, I mean, if you're a broker, if you're a licensed broker, or if you're an investment advisor, then that's fine. Then knock yourself out. But otherwise I would, um, I, Bethany and I both agree that we just don't like the term capital raiser anyway. Um, it's just, you know, you can't, you're not getting paid to raise capital. That's one of your duties as a syndicator as part of one of you, one of 20 things you need to do, but nobody should be purely raising capital as their primary function in on your team uh, everybody needs to be doing spending more than half of their time doing something other than raising capital and that other stuff should be substantial that, that those are sort of the, the legal uh terms i'm sorry i skipped all the way down i don't know if i yeah it, 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 and paula to be clear he means finra broker licensed broker dealer not a real estate broker correct correct yeah um chad had a good question here um uh what's the most commonly accepted structure as it relates to promote and cash flow, um, any common themes and and common is kind of going out the window these days. So yeah, but I would say the standard. Yeah, but I would say the standard is a two percent acquisition fee, not based on how much money you raise, but based on the 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 cost of the acquisition. Again, you don't want to get you don't want to be seen as taking a percentage of you know I raise raised ten million dollars. So an acquisition fee usually is on either the purchase price of the property or maybe the acquisition cost if you're going to add you know other stuff. Uh, so two percent acquisition fee, two percent. Um, asset management fee, but that's not under assets under management, but it would be based, typically we see it based on effective rents. So whatever rents are, and again, that's just to kind of keep the lights on and pay for the rent and the office. You're not, you're not, um, you know, you're not getting rich off that. Uh, and then 20%, I think it comes from that two and 20, 80, 20 is probably the most common followed by 70, 30, and then, you know, 75, 25, that, that's really the range. And then I have seen I think, I don't know if you're seeing more and more of this. I don't know. I, Bethany, where are we on the trend on this? But I mean, we we were seeing the hurdles, right? So it's 80, 20 or 70, 30 until you reach 15% or 70%. And then anything above that will be 50, 50 or something else. Yeah. Uh, would you say that's that's continuing or is it getting tighter these days? Um, I've seen as low as 12 even. It, it kicks over to um, like a you know, 60, 40, 50, 50. And I've seen it flip all the way back the other way where it gets down to 20, 80 once you hit a certain crazy return. And, and, you know, the reality is for a while there were, could we have been hitting that? Yeah. Are we going to do that now? I don't know. Um, but it, it's always nice to let the investors know um, we're not really taking our, you know, big chunk as sponsors until, until you're doing really well. So that's, that's nice to know, but it's, it's, we don't get a ton of waterfall. A lot of times it's just a straight split usually. I always tell the story that when we were, when I was, if you guys know, I was general counsel for the real estate guys and, uh, and Robin Russ, but we had one deal, but we had like, it was so freaking complicated. It was like 8% prep. And then the first million dollars was 80, 20. And then the next million and a half was 50, 50. And the next million it was the, we literally had six tranches or something and investors were so confused. And as I mentioned earlier, a confused mind and investor is not, is not, uh, not, not something you want. So keep it simple. I think a pref and one hurdle is simple. I don't think that's super complicated, but I would I would caution. I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm just saying uh, I'm not sure that I would be doing that unless you, you you've got a, a really good track record and, and you've been doing it for a while. Uh, Paula, Mauricio, when the interest rates went up, some of the deals returns went down. Yes, even if the GP pro, oh, even if the GP purchased interest cap cap rates, yep, um, they still decrease the percent of the returns. Return, yeah. Would all of the scenarios be placed in the company agreement up front to be managed by the GP? Right. I mean, think about it. So typically in in in, in these distributions, you're getting a percentage, the investor's getting a percentage of the distributable cash. And the distributable cash is revenue minus your expenses, minus your cost. And so if your cost is going up, uh, because interest rates, you know, are going up because you know you, you've got a floating interest rate and you haven't hit your cap yet then your distributable cash is going to be lower. The, the, the company's distributable. There's going to be less money to distribute. And so by definition, you're going to have a lower return if that's the case, um, which is why one of the things, I mean, it's getting so, I was just talking to a couple of clients, it's getting so expensive to do those, ca- uh, those lock, locking those cap, uh, those interest rates, those cap. Um, but, you know, you can, that's one of your stress tests, I guess, that you can do as a limited, as a limited partner, as you can see, what does the pro forma look like if interest rates go up to whatever that max is? 
right? And you can look at what the returns are, just like you can do what are the returns looking like once you hit a certain sort of occupancy rate, if you're worried that occupancy is going to start going up. So you can run all those scenarios, but uh, that's all locked in. Uh, you know, at least you're going to know that the, the one, the thing you're going to know ahead of time is what is that cost? What's the insurance to lock that rate going to cost? And it's getting crazy, but at least you know that beforehand. But uh, at least you know, you know, the, the, the cost of the debt can go up if it's a floating rate every month. But at least you know what the cap is because you bought, assuming you bought insurance on it, so it cannot go higher than, you know, eight percent or whatever the the cap is. And so you can run your own numbers and see, well, what what happens if interest rates go to ten percent and and I reach my cap? Then what what do the numbers look like? Uh, and that all should be disclosed, by the way. I hope that goes without saying. Yeah. Jared had an, an interesting, a good question. I think we touched on it a little bit, which is, is a GP split on an evergreen fund of funds common? See two fund of funds questions here. Yeah, um, I mean the the common is the two and twenty. It's the two and twenty. That's the common. And again, I don't think it's anything. I think most people are just stealing it from the hedge fund. Two percent asset management fee, twenty percent of the profits. And when you see the two and twenty, that twenty percent is your promote, which means it's an eighty twenty split. So, in fact, whenever people ask me about pro formas and stuff, what I always recommend is just if you're not clear on how to underwrite it, I always just tell folks to throw up their eighty twenty. That's where that's the starting point because that's what is typical. So throw up 80 20 and see what comes out. And if the returns are too low or too high, then you can start adjusting and putting a pref in there or maybe going 70 30 or doing whatever. But but because I think the the vast majority, I'm going to say way over 50% of the deals are 80 20, uh, followed probably by 70 30 and then followed by 75 25. But um, uh, and then the question just becomes is there a pref? the pref in there, but 80, 20, I would say, yeah, unless, unless you're seeing something change, uh, Bethany in the last year. Well, last the, the one thing I will say though, as it relates to at least an evergreen fund is just for simplicity sake, we see a little bit more often just a straight pref because it's easier to manage the in and out of folks versus pricing splits as people come in later and later and later. Right. So unless you want to be kind of constantly updating valuations or whatever, then a straight, um, can we get avocado? I just got thrown off by avocado. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the uh, so a straight pref is simpler when you've got an evergreen fund, um, but that doesn't mean you can't do splits. It just means it's just a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more to consider as you figure out pricing. Um, and then you know, I'm gonna pull up the link for the. Yeah, I mean, I just I just email the team. I'm actually give you the thing. It's just email team at plglp.com. I'm sure it's a unique link or something. It may even be a different link every week. So just just email the team and just say I'd love to be on uh, Bethany's. Yeah, Ashley uh, will get you. She'll get you hooked up. Wednesdays. Okay. All right. Um, um, I was hoping to get confirmation for next week. I'm I'm still working. Uh, off. There it is. Um, well, it's not going to happen. Uh, I was trying to get Garrett Sutton to do some asset protection with us next week, but he's on the road. So I'll keep working on that. And uh, But until then, we, again, always appreciate it. It was a big turnout today. It was about 80 something people on today. So I really, really appreciate it. Join us on the Facebook community, mauricioraul.com, FB group. And uh, we'll send out the replay probably tomorrow and uh, appreciate all your guys' support. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.